I'm Mark Ronkase. Let me say a thing or two about our project, and I'll turn it over to John here, and he can, he can give you more of the details. Uh, the title we have is Questioning the Bible. Uh, kind of a suggestive title. It's not really what I think it is. Uh, the idea for the project actually first originated uh, when uh, Burns Coleman and I were talking, and he jokingly said, um, we, talking to me, he said, we should, we should write a textbook. We were trying to figure out what textbooks to use. He said, well, we should write a textbook. And uh, so that got me thinking, if, if I did a textbook, which of course I wouldn't because everything that you could possibly say about the Bible at introductory level has been said, um, I thought, what would it, you know, what would it look like? And you know, I, I thought, well, it would be a series of questions. Um, that's all it would be, you know, open-ended discussion prompts. Um, and then I and continued digging around, and there was no resource like that uh, that existed. So I thought we would you know, get a start here with the summer project. We, of course, by no means produced uh, discussion questions for every chapter of the Bible, but that was the idea. Uh, so we, we got a good start. Um, we did, what we essentially ended up producing was a sample for a book proposal. Uh, so at the end of July, beginning part of August, um, we took what we had, and let me back up and say, uh, the original plan was for John to work on some stuff and me to write up some questions and then to pass them back and forth and proceed that way. But John just, uh, you know, pumping stuff out constantly, I could never really even get to the questions myself. He's sending me 10,000 word files about every week or two. And so I, I don't know how many words he wrote this summer, but I mean, he probably wrote enough for a book. Uh, and then I would take them and edit them and kind of combine them and reframe them uh, uh, to sharpen them up a little bit. Uh, and so we sent that off at the end of the summer, uh, about a month ago, as, as a sample along with a, a book proposal uh, that I had written up to um, a couple of uh, pretty significant, pretty major uh, publishers in, in the biblical studies uh, world and academia and church related publishing. And um, just last week, uh, I, I say this to brag strictly on John here, uh, one of those um, uh, publishing houses responded back saying we're very interested, we think it's a great idea, we're thoroughly impressed with the sample, we're going to send this out to uh, three external reviewers, he had some suggestions as to you know, how we might improve it, that's always a good idea when editors are giving suggestions. Um, so who knows exactly where it will come of it, but um, I, I think you know, it's pretty impressive that uh, uh, John's work uh, as an undergraduate, obviously, uh, essentially impressed the senior editor, or one of the senior editors of a major publishing house, enough to <coughs> pursue, uh, continue pursuing that possible publication. So uh, I was quite pleased with that, and not really surprised. I thought John had done excellent work, um, and I was glad that he agreed, and I'll see what the three external reviewers uh, think, and we'll go from there. So uh, that's a bit of an overview of what we've done. Uh, John can now uh, give you more of the specifics and the details. Uh, let me also mention that after uh, the second presentation, um, there will be a reception there in the, in the back lobby, uh, and we'd be happy to have you join us. John? So, I'm John from Reading, I'm a studies major. Um, and like Dr. Ron Case said, our project was called Questioning the Bible. So, let's get to it, shall we? Everyone here as excited as I am. Um, for centuries, people have been asking questions, and for centuries, these questions have been met with mixed reactions. Some question, some questioning is encouraged and some questioning is shot down. However, in some cases, questions have been shot down only to be looked at and looked over once again as time went on. For example, um, Nicholas Copernicus questioned the idea of whether or not the Earth was really the center of the universe. And when he first did this, he was considered a heretic and considered to be absolutely crazy. But as time went on and further studies were done, not only was he not crazy, but he turned out to be right. The Bible is a book viewed and interpreted in many different ways by many different people. Many, many people still look at the Bible the same way people were looking at it hundreds of years ago. When I told people what I was doing for my project, it was met with, of course, mixed reactions. Some people saw what I was doing was flat out wrong. And other people love the whole concept behind the Dr. Ron case, and I wouldn't do this summer. These mixed reactions have shown me that the Bible, for many people, falls into the category of something you absolutely should not question. But for myself, personally, my summer has shown me that not only can you question the Bible, but you should. 
question the Bible. We should look at the Bible from different perspectives. It seems that when we don't question things and when we accept the world as the way it is around us, we don't see things how they really are. Imagine if Copernicus had not had the guts to say, wait a second, maybe the earth isn't the center of the universe. Maybe that big orange thing that shows up for 12 hours every day is the center. If he wouldn't have had the guts, then maybe Galileo may have, may have chickened out, and then the whole domino effect may have caused us to not even realize that we're not the center of the universe until maybe even a hundred years ago. When people question things and look for other ways to look at something and look at fresh perspectives, new forms of knowledge come about. And that is why Dr. Ron Case and I tackled this project. Yes. Our project was different from all the others because we really didn't have a set goal. Um, some of my roommates, I uh, lived with the summer, they had all a uh, summer research project, people in one apartment, as you can imagine. Um, it was a very exciting summer with Super Nintendo and watching VH1 Classic. But most people's projects were, we, we're here at point A, we're going to do some things to try to get to point B, and if we get there, then we've succeeded. If we don't get there, we're going to talk about why we didn't succeed. But Dr. Ron Case and I, our goal was more along the lines of conduct a thorough study and make questions for a book from each genre within the Bible. We then wanted to take the early drafts, whittle them down into our best questions, and prepare a manuscript to be sent out to publishers as a sample for a future book. So with that in mind, I want to give kind of a brief synopsis of what we did and how we did it. And what I did this summer can be summed up in one easy sentence. Um, read a whole dad gum lot. Um, but I, that really is what I did. I spent a lot of time in the Bible, reading the Bible, reading different translations of the Bible, um, reading all kinds of different commentaries and other outside sources of the Bible, and then looking at that, thinking about it, and producing questions. It's a very simple um, way to do something, but it just takes time. You can ask um, my fiance Angela, she calls and say, what are you doing? I'm saying, I'm in the library. Why don't you give me the library? Um, to about 6 o'clock. She goes, oh, it's calm when you're done. Um, but Dr. Runcase and I made a deliberate effort, a deliberate effort to choose different books from different parts of the Bible. We didn't just focus strictly on Gospels or Old Testament or prophetic literature. Um, so each book we looked at was from a different genre in the Bible. Dr. Runcase and I would start by bouncing a few ideas back and forth by email, and sometimes it was a really long email, sometimes it was like a two-word email um, of what book we should go over next, and then I would spend a week or so per book and then send him my sample <coughs> questions. And to get my ideas for questions, I would first read a chapter in whatever book I was doing. Uh, so, for example, if I was doing Mark, I would read Mark 1, and then I will read different translations of it, and I would read commentaries on it. And if it was a really small book, like Colossians, I would just sit down and read the whole book and then go from there. But I would read a couple of different commentaries in the chapter I just read. And in case you, in case you don't know, I'm throwing the word commentary around like it's common English. But a commentary is basically just a big, thick book, and I have one in my backpack. Um, it's a big, thick book of a bunch of religious scholars and professors who basically write their professional opinions on a chapter or a verse or a book of the Bible. So after I read some of each commentary, I would try to kind of literally step outside of myself and step into the shoes of someone else. Um, for example, I would try to get in touch with my feminine side and imagine seeing the text through the eyes of a woman. Or I would try to imagine what kind of impact a certain verse or chapter of scripture would have on a child um, dying of AIDS in Africa. So I would basically try to ask questions from a perspective other than my white, male, middle class, American, and Protestant self. So let's look at some examples, um, some samples. The samples we'll be looking at today come from two books, um, First Kings and Ecclesiastes. And I know these books may not be the most exciting books in the whole Bible at surface level and first glance, but I chose these two books because I knew very, very little about them. Um, I'd always kind of take them at surface level and we didn't really talk about them much in Sunday school. And upon reading them, I understood why we didn't talk about them much in Sunday school. <laughs> But at the end of the summer, I discovered how deep and how engrossing and how different two books 
can be within the same body. Because when you go to church, you hear just like samples, like a few verses um, from a certain book, and you feel like, oh, well, that's what the whole book's about. Well, that uh, couldn't be farther from the truth. So the first sample we'll be looking at is 1 Kings. And 1 Kings is an Old Testament, um, or as Dr. Ron Case likes to call it, a Hebrew Bible book. And it's considered to be more along the lines of narrative in genre, which means it tells a story. It has a definite beginning and end. It's not just a bunch of random thoughts. Modern Old Testament scholars consider the book to be under the genre of, if I mispronounce this word, please forgive me, it's about this long on the paper, Deuteronomistic history. That's a mouthful. Um, First and Second Kings were originally one big book until the Bible was translated over into Greek and it was split in half. And First and Second Kings contain nearly 400 years of Israel's history as seen through the eyes of a prophet or various prophets. First and Second Kings start at the ascension of King Solomon. Everyone knows King Solomon. If you've ever been to BBS, you know about King Solomon. You know about his infinite wisdom. Um, it starts at the ascension of Solomon to the throne, and then it goes to the fall of Jerusalem in 587 BCE. And my focus was on chapters 1 through 9, which do focus on how King Solomon went from being really the son of a dying King David to the king. And also his building and dedication of the temple. So 1 and 2 Samuel, the two books before 1 and 2 Kings, ended with David as king. And 1 Kings opens with David being a very old man, and literally on his deathbed, and the process of a new king being put in place. So through much fighting and scheming amongst David, King David's family, Solomon is made king. Chapter 1 goes into great detail about everything going on behind the scenes leading up to Solomon being made king. Bathsheba, everyone knows the story of Bathsheba, how King David watched her bathing and wanted to have her as his wife. Bathsheba is the infamous wife of King David and the mother of Solomon. And she plays an extremely large role in getting Solomon on the throne, um, a much larger role than you might expect. Adonijah, that's a heck of a name. Um, name one of your children that you know, Adonijah. Adonijah is Solomon's brother who wanted to be king so badly that he literally um, got gathered together an army of soldiers and men and generals and tried to take the throne by force. Uh, but Solomon does next to nothing for his own cause. And my favorite set of ideas and questions that come from chapter 1 is this. And it says, Solomon seemingly has little to do with his ascension to power. Solomon sits by passively throughout the entire process. Others plot and plead for Solomon to be king. Other people acquire a mule for Solomon to ride on. Solomon is brought to Gainon and anointed as a result of other people's action. How does this ascent to power compare to modern politics? Contrast the ambitious and headstrong Adonijah, who, of course, is disposed and kicked off the throne. What does this say about the view of kingship in ancient Israel, or at least in the narrator's view? And I love the ideas from this question because it sort of sets the tone for the rest of the book. Solomon is supposedly this great king. So many people look up to Solomon. So many people see him as the ideal Christian ruler. But a closer look at the biblical text and at the Bible, this isn't some outside source, this isn't anything pulled from something else, the biblical text. If you have your Bible at home, go look at it. It's in there. It shows that Solomon is not only very human, but his rise to power was very, very questionable and downright sneaky. And being in the spirit of the political season, this question raises more questions about having to do with modern politics. Chapter 1 basically shows that Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, is responsible for getting him into power. Solomon does nothing. He does absolutely nothing, but Bathsheba works behind the scenes, and one could argue that she lies to King David to get Solomon on the throne. And that never happens today, right? No, no politicians ever step behind people's backs, and no politicians ever rely on where they come from to get their seat, right? That never happens. But even more interesting in this opening chapter is that we as the readers can take something very interesting away from 1 Kings. And that is the author of 1 Kings may not really like Solomon. Um, if anything, one could argue that the author of 1 Kings 
may have been subtly tried to poke fun at Solomon and to kind of make Solomon look bad and look lazy. And also Solomon's famous, famous judgment, everyone knows Solomon's judgment. Um, the, two, the two women come up and say, this baby is mine, and this baby is mine. And Solomon says, cut the baby in half. And one woman says, fine, do it, whatever. And another woman says, no, don't do that. Let her have it. Um, it's better for her to have the whole thing than for the baby to die. And then King Solomon says, give the baby to her. And everything is resolved. Everything's all right. But is, is everything all right? The cut the baby in half story raises a lot of questions in itself. Was Solomon being metaphorical, or is he literally telling these women to cut the baby in half? Because the text never says, and Solomon metaphorically said, cut the baby in half. <laughs> the text says, cut the baby in half. And did the real mother really get the baby? The text simply says, give the baby to the first woman. And different translations and interpretations show that we're not really sure who the first woman is. We're not really sure if the baby ended up in the hands of the right woman. And is this brand of justice typical today? I mean, imagine if uh, two people going through divorce would show up in the custody court and the judge were to say, cut the children in half. You shall have 1.5 child, you shall have 1.5 child. I mean, what kind of reaction would that get? But these are just some of the numerous <coughs> ideas and thoughts and questions and modern connections that can be made with the themes and undertones of First Kings. Now, as normal as First Kings may be, the narrative and its definite beginning and its definite end, Ecclesiastes is a whole different breed of book. It's completely different. Um, the message of Ecclesiastes can be summed up by saying, eat, drink, and be merry because you never know when you're going to die. And that's true. It literally says that within the text. Ecclesiastes claims to be written by a person known simply as the teacher, which comes from the Hebrew word Koheleth. That's a, that's a heck of a name for somebody. Um, the book's opening verse attributes the book to this teacher, while also claiming the teacher was the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Ecclesiastes falls into the wisdom literature genre, and the book is full of the teacher's commentary on the interaction between traditional theology of the time period and the world around us. The book is basically how the person known as the teacher views the world. It's basically one person sat down, thought about things, and wrote his thoughts down. The teacher constantly refers to all actions that we do, everything that everybody do, does in the text as vain, futile, empty, meaningless, temporary, or fleeting. That in itself raises many questions such as how are modern Christians or modern people who read the Bible supposed to take the book of Ecclesiastes? A minister friend of mine and I were talking about this one day and he said that he feels like the writer of Ecclesiastes is being sarcastic. And I was like, whoa, whoa I'm not really sure how I feel about that. And I would strongly disagree that the writer of Ecclesiastes is, is being sarcastic in how he feels about the world. To simply brush the message of Ecclesiastes off and ignoring the tough issues it raises is not only discrediting the book, but discrediting all the work and all the thoughts and everything the author went to to make the book. With all that being said, uh, chapter 1, verse 2 says, Vanity of vanities, says the teacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And I'm not talking about vanity like one of those... Um, Chester drawer things with a big mirror. I'm talking about vanity um, in the sense of everything in life is fleeting. And the, my favorite, probably my favorite question out of everything we did this summer, my favorite thought is this. The word vanity has been variously understood and translated. Since it is not a word that we use commonly today, um, take this verse and try reading different words in the place of vanity such as pointless, meaningless, absurd, empty, futile, or hollow? And how does the substitution influence interpretation? When we read this verse, we could be guilty of letting what it is really saying, what the author is trying to say to us, simply slip by us. But if you switch the word vanity with one of those words, you really see what the author is trying to say, such as pointless, pointless of pointlessness, Everything in the world is pointless. The teacher is using 
verse 2 to start off the entire theme of the book, which is that everything in life is vanity. Everything in life is fleeting. That's what the teacher believes. That's how he views the world. No matter what we do, no matter how we do it, according to the teacher, everything is pointless, and we have no control over what God will do. The will of God is going to be carried out whether we like it or not. And many people would agree with this statement by saying that yes, the good and the perfect will of God rules over all, and everything will turn out the way God wants it to. But the teacher of Ecclesiastes really strongly disagrees with viewing God's will like that. Verses 12 to 14 of chapter 1 say, I, the teacher, when king over Israel and Jerusalem, apply my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all his vanity and chasing after wind. So is the teacher really saying that everything good and bad in life comes from God? Because I think that's what the teacher is saying. I think that's how the teacher views the world. What's the modern practical fallout of this person, this book's view on life? What if everything, including bad, in life does come from God? And my reading, thinking, and questioning for Ecclesiastes showed me that not everyone in that time period was happy. Not everyone was humble in saying that we're struggling now, but God will see us through. This teacher definitely has a very, very different way of looking at the world. Now, I personally feel that the questions made from Ecclesiastes, the questions that Dr. Ron Case and I put together, were the strongest out of our entire study because there are no easy answers. This isn't like, what did Jesus say to so-and-so, or what effect does the crucifixion have on the world today? It's not a very positive, uplifting book. If anything, it's a book that if you read it, it's very much of a downer. The questions raise more questions than they answer. And they push us out of our comfort zone. A book like this containing the message of God causes good and bad things to happen, and we have no control whatsoever over what will come of us, may be difficult for people to grasp, but maybe people maybe difficult for people to understand. <coughs> the teacher, I feel like, has some truth because Everybody's born, everyone in this room is born, you need to show up one day, and everybody in this room is going to die. <coughs> Those are two absolutes. And the teacher talks about that more so than anything. And the teacher says that we should spend less energy on worrying about the next life, we should focus on the life right now. And I wouldn't go as far as to say, eat, drink, and be merry, <coughs> but I would say that I agree with the teacher in that we should give this life more of a shot. We shouldn't step back and say, all right, well, I'm just going to look forward to the next slide because that's what's important to me. So those are the two samples that I wanted to show. And I feel like the practical implications of this project speak for itself. The project speaks for itself. A minister, a Sunday school teacher, a Bible study leader, a religion professor could take our finished product and he or she could use it as a way to give kind of a fresh perspective on the Bible. Or they could use it as a discussion tool. And very, very few of the questions we prepared, if any of the questions, have simple answers. Each question is meant to make a person or group think critically and think of a different perspective. Some of the questions may frustrate people. Some of the questions may make people angry. Others may be taken back by how out of the box some of the questions are. Either way, it is nearly impossible to have the same old Bible when looking at the questions Dr. Ron Case and I put together. And I um, personally used some of the questions and thoughts and ideas um, on my youth group in First Baptist Church. At First Baptist Church page in the South Carolina, they're my guinea pigs. Don't tell anybody. Um, the discussions and thoughts that were brought about and used from these questions were unlike any we had at that point. And what I learned personally from the project has been very, very rewarding, more rewarding than I could have ever imagined. I look at the Bible with a refreshed perspective, and I don't see it as an old, outdated, dusty book, but rather a book full of potential that is really yet to even be tapped into. I've also learned how to research and study something like the Bible, which is good, because after college I want to go to a master's degree and a PhD, um, and for those of you who don't know, a PhD in religion is basically a license to read. 
I discovered what commentaries my authors I prefer, and I also discovered the library has more in it than I originally thought. You know, whenever I came here, I thought the library was just a place with a bunch of books no one ever used and a place to print something off and go to academic sort of career, but there's more in there than that. And it's not just a coffee shop. It's a pretty sweet place. You should check it out. But the biggest thing, the thing that I took away from this summer and will always have is that the Bible is still very relevant and should not ever be denied a fresh look. When we go up to the Bible and look at it the same way every time, we're doing the Bible a terrible, terrible injustice. For the first time in a long time, the Bible became more than just something to look at and try and study. It became something that almost came alive. It is a book that is asking us questions and challenging us to change the way we view the world around us. We should not take the Bible as just a book that fell down from heaven and God said, use this. No, that's not, that's not how the Bible came about. We're doing a disservice to all the people who spent lifetime writing and putting our Bible together if we do that. Each author had their own purpose and own reasoning for writing their book, and each book has its proper place within the Bible. Books like 1 Kings are there to show us that the prophets have a view of history all their own, while books like Ecclesiastes are there to show us that not everybody views God as this good and perfect thing. Through all the controversy today about how to read the Bible and what place the Bible has in society, we should never, ever stop looking for new ways to read the Bible. Because when we do stop looking, when we do stop questioning, the Bible really does become a dead and outdated book. And that's all I have. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. One. Yes, no. It's hot here. But um, that's it for me. Thank you for your time.